Today with Joseph Prince. The church is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. Don't think of your business as central and you go to church on Sundays on the site. No, the church, the body of Christ is central. Everything, that the depository of heaven is in the church. Amen. The fullness of God's blessing is in the church. If we can become holy in thought, word, and deed without Christ, would have made it, David would have done it a long time ago. It's a, it's, a, it's a difficult lesson, but a painful one that we have to go through. And every time you are into self-righteousness, grace stops. Remember this. Grace cannot flow where there is condemnation. When Jesus taught the, the disciples how to speak to the, fig, I mean, to the mountain, be thou removed. Remember that the, the, the whole episode was because Jesus came to this fig tree. It was on the way from Bethany to Jerusalem. Many times, those of you who are there, you walk down that same path. The fig tree is no more there, right? It's cursed. All right? But there are other fig trees there. And, and the fig is a very interesting tree. After winter, where it sheds its leaves and all that, all right? The moment summer comes near, springtime, it will put out leaves. And the Bible says that Jesus went to one of these fig trees looking for food, for fruit. But the Bible says the time of figs was not yet. So why did Jesus go to the fig tree having leaves, the Bible says, having leaves, but no fruit? And why did Jesus curse the fig tree if, if it's not the time for figs? He didn't curse it because he was angry. He didn't curse it because he lost his temper. He cursed it because it's an object lesson. All right? Fig tree, leaves, no fruit, sterile. He cursed it. Why? Because he doesn't want people to be deceived. The first mention of fig leaves is Adam and Eve covering themselves with fig leaves. So fig leaf represents what? Self-righteousness. And when you're into self-righteousness, listen, faith cannot flow. Faith cannot flow. The law is self-righteousness. And that's why in Galatians, it tells us, yet the law is not of faith. The law is not of faith. Listen, the law is not of faith. It's on performance. The man who doeth them shall live in them. So the moment you are in performance, your faith cannot work. If you are in speaking and believing, speaking and believing, speaking and believing, that's the spirit of faith that God wants you to have. Are you listening, people? Amen? We having the same spirit of faith. I believe and therefore I speak. I believe and therefore I speak. That's the kind of faith that God wants you to have. Amen? Don't worry about corresponding actions. Amen? When God saw darkness, God didn't say, wow, so dark. God said, light be. Amen? What was God's corresponding action? Nothing. Many a times, believing and speaking is enough. Amen. Amen. The righteousness of faith speaks. The righteousness of the law doeth. Hmm. I say the righteousness of faith speaks. Righteousness of the law doeth. The law is not of faith. Their antithesis is like water and, 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 and oil. They cannot mix. If you are under self-righteousness, under performance, your faith cannot flow. Amen? So Jesus taught us how to believe and speak. Believe, speak. So go back to Mark 11. Then Jesus, Peter, remembering, said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the next day, the fig tree which you curse has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, he believed that what he says happens, will happen, it will happen. The same spirit of faith we thought a few weeks ago, I believe and therefore I speak. Amen? I believe, I speak. In almost every language of the world, the devil has programmed death. It's the devil who has programmed this. Instead of saying, I'm living for the piece of cake. We say, I'm dying for the piece of cake. You know, the thing is that we don't realize, you know, this, this is not splitting hairs, okay, over, over expression. This is actually life and death. I believe, therefore I speak. Jesus never spoke what he saw. He spoke what he wanted to see. All right? You don't, don't say, well, the goiter is getting bigger. You say, I curse this goiter in Jesus' name. I see life flowing through my body. I see health and wholeness. Amen. Amen. I see my husband sitting beside me. Not this guy, but my husband. Don't, don't raise your hands right now so no one will know. Amen? Thank God. I'm married. I'm, just tell the Lord. Don't tell people I'm married, okay? Tell the Lord, I'm married. Amen. Lord, I'm married. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Whatever you need. Amen. Start believing and start speaking. I don't believe that one bit. Well, you just exercise that. You believe and you say you don't believe. It won't happen to you. Amen? Are you with me, church? 
In other words, you've got to curse the fig tree, the fig leaves that with us. You must curse self-righteousness before faith can operate. That's what Jesus was showing. It's a parable in action. Amen. To this cursing of the fig tree. He cursed the fig tree having leaves, which we learned the first mention is self-righteousness. He cursed that. And then he says your faith can operate. What if there was a better way to navigate some of life's biggest challenges? Introducing Grace Academy. Featuring brand new content from Joseph Prince, Grace Academy is a digital pastoring experience designed to help you navigate some of life's hardest questions. I pray these resources will inspire and equip you to live confidently every day. Get free access today. Text GA to 71239 or visit josephprince.org GA. Incidentally, I was studying this one day and the Lord brought me into Revelation where it says the tree of life in heaven, the leaves are for healing. Have you read before? So the difference is this, self-righteousness produces sickness. The leaves of God's righteousness means what? Life and health. Hmm. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Are you all learning, church? Yes. And notice that Jesus says the only criteria, don't doubt in your heart. Your heart. Don't, don't doubt. Doubt. Say doubt. Now, this word doubt is not the usual word, distazo, in Greek. Like Jesus told Peter when he sang, Jesus says, why did you doubt? It's not the usual Greek word. This word doubt is actually the word that means, it's di- uh, diakrino in, in Greek. It's a very interesting word. It actually means making a difference. Jesus is saying, all right, when you, you know when I speak to the fig tree, the same way I spoke to the fig tree, you can speak to the mountain. And it will obey you. So even in the natural, people talk about talking to plants and all that. Listen carefully. Jesus is saying, don't make a difference about talking to plants and speaking to your mountain. You say, it's a difference. Plant, mountain. Jesus says, don't make a difference. Diacrino is, all right, do not doubt. Doubt is make a difference. Do not make a difference. Sometimes you say, I can pray for headaches, Pastor Prince. All right. See, I pray for this brother. Then another one comes. What do you have? I have AIDS. Have you repented? Have you done this? Have you given up this? Have you given up that? You know, we make a difference. Jesus says in Matthew, if you have faith, you will not only do that which is done to the fig tree, but also if you speak to the mountain. Don't make a difference. In fact, it's easier for God to heal cancer, if I can say it that way, than headache. I'm not saying it's hard for him to heal a headache. In God's economy, it took five loaves and two fish to feed 5,000 men. When it came to 7,000 men, more men, it took only four loaves. In God's economy, the bigger the problem, the easier. So when someone comes to you and say, cancer, no problem. What's your problem? Pimple. Oh, I gotta use my faith. If we start not to make a difference, it will change. But more than that, let's go deeper into the root meaning of dia crino. The word dia, when you, whenever you find the word dia in Greek, it means through the channel of, by means of, dia. Crino is the word for judging, judge, condemn. So you put them together, is the word, the root word is condemn, there's condemnation in your heart. That's why you're making a difference. That's why you're doubting. That's why you're wavering. There's condemnation in your heart. Dia crino, through the means of condemnation. Now, I'm going to show you somewhere in Scripture where it brings all this together, okay? In uh, Romans 14, real quick. Do you have faith? And all the people said? Yes. Okay, one more time. Do you have faith? Yes. All those in the second floor? Yes. Third floor near the heavens? You have stronger faith, amen? You're the first to go in the rapture, you know that, right? (laughs) All right, do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Now watch this. Happy is he, referring to food, okay? Not drinking wine or drinking wine or eating meat and all that. So Paul finally says, do you have faith? Happy is he who does not condemn himself. Watch this word, condemn. It's the word krino. 
So dia crino is actually condemning yourself. If you condemn yourself, you cannot have faith operating. Why? Because self-righteousness is an operation. So there are people confessing the right things. By his stripes I'm healed, God supplies my needs, but they are in condemnation, they are in fear. Many of them start doing that when they are desperate and it's a bit too late. You know, they are not establishing their spirit. They have not heard grace. They have heard about healing. They haven't heard about grace. You see, the Bible says, seek his righteousness and all these things, provisions, supply, healing will be added. You don't even have to release faith many a times for provision. It comes. When you seek his righteousness, you see, when you were a sinner, did you have to believe for sickness? When you were a sinner, did you have to believe for lack, for stress, depression? No, it came because you were a sinner. All right, now that you're a believer, just seek his righteousness. Believe that he has made you righteous and all the blessings happen to you automatically. They'll be added. I'll close with this. Very interesting, beautiful story that begins almost in a very depressive way, in a sad way, but ends up glorious, like the things that God does. It's a national disaster from the Old Testament that is unprecedented in Israel's history. Year after year, God warned Israel not to worship other gods, not to worship idols. And they worship all kinds of idols under every green tree, on hills, they will even sacrifice their babies and their toddlers to their gods as a human sacrifice. And God sent Jeremiah, God sent Isaiah, and God warned them, stop doing this, come back to God. Listen, you know, every other sin that Israel committed, God never disowned them from the land. Are you listening, people? Because they were still worshiping God. As long as the burnt offering is going up, the blessing comes down. But the moment they exchange gods, the moment, and in essence today we are doing that when we exchange Christ's righteousness for self-righteousness, the moment they exchange God, they stop offering. And the blessing stop. And in 386 BC, Nebuchadnezzar came in, the king of Babylon came in, and God allowed him to have victory over his people. He burned down the temple, took all, enslaved all the people of Judah, people of Israel, and brought the best of them into Babylon, leaving behind all the old, the invalid in the land. The very best he took with him into Babylon. It was the greatest disaster in the Old Testament. And God warned them already. But God, even though in the Old Testament, God in essence was putting men under probation before him as judge. God still provide the burnt offering. And God in his mercy, the same prophet Jeremiah that prophesied that this will happen also said that this captivity is only for 70 years. All right? 36 years after Nebu took the people of Israel captive, a king of Persia by the name of Cyrus conquered Babylon without even firing an arrow. All right? He took over the whole thing. It's amazing how, how, how it happened. God assisted him. God was the one that provided for him because Cyrus' name was mentioned by prophet Isaiah before the captivity. Even before Cyrus was born, God called him by name. And God said that this Middle Persian king is my anointed. Cyrus, my anointed. And guess what? When he took over, all right, Babylon, this Middle Persian king, king of Persia, he told all the Hebrews, when he found out that his name was in the Bible, <laughs> when he found out he was called by name before he was even born by one of the prophets of Israel, he told all the Hebrew people, go back and rebuild the temple. And I'll provide for you. So that's the thing uh, that happened at the end of 70 years, all right, Israel in captivity, started going back, all right, to ruins. Just nothing but ruins, ashes. The temple has been raised to the ground. And the Bible tells us that in 535 BC, after two years of returning to the land, they did nothing about the temple. 
And then they started rebuilding the foundation of the temple. Now listen carefully, because every one of you that wants to build a career, a ministry, a home, a family, all right, your marriage, whatever it is, understand this. The principle shared in God's word is for today. It's all for us today. It's telling us how to build, and more than anything else that we want to build, we want to build the body of Christ. All around the world, when God looks down, God doesn't see the uh, church A, B, C, X, Y, Z. God sees one church, actually. Amen. And, and God wants us to be passionate. It's one thing that, if you look at what's happening in the world, in the news, in the media, and all that, they're all happening, all right, because of these three reasons. Number one, Christ. God is preparing for His Son to return. All right? Some things are happening from the devil, but God is turning out for our good. Okay? Around the world today, everything is happening because of Jesus. Number two, the church, the body of Christ. Amen? The church is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. Don't think of your business as central and you go to church on Sundays on the site. No, the church, the body of Christ is central. Everything, that the depository of heaven is in the church. Amen? The fullness of God's blessing is in the church. So everything that's happening around the world, is, number two is the church. And number three, God's chosen nation, Israel. Everything. That's why they are in the news all the time. Okay? So if you are building, if you are, you are building a career, whatever, make sure it's linked to the church. Make sure it's to build the house of God. And that's why this ministry here, we are not insular. We are not looking inward. We are looking to bless the entire world. For some reason, God saw fit to look at this red dot in Southeast Asia. And in this red dot, just a red dot, there is a small dot <laughs> called New Creation Church. And in this small dot within the red dot, there is a small dot that is minuscule. A guy called Joseph Prince, and people don't understand why in the world would God want to use him. And he agrees. And God says, from here, my gospel will go forth to the four corners of the earth. He said, but, but Pastor Prince, why? I don't know why. It's called grace. Grace. We're not pushing with arm of flesh. We're not doing anything. All right? Maybe it's like God to choose the weak and small things. If you say, but Pastor Prince, I see you are weak. You are right. You don't know how you are right. Amen. It's got nothing to do with who we are. Amen. This beautiful, this beautiful place. Do we deserve it? No. It's called unearned, undeserved favor. Amen. You can live in the realm of deserved favor if you want, but I'll live in the realm of undeserved favor. Amen, Amen church. Unmerited favor. So what happened is they came back and... Two years after they came back, they woke up and said, hey, don't forget the purpose for which the king sent us back to rebuild the temple. So this is what happened in Ezra chapter 3. Now in the second month of the second year of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, Zorobabel, Zorobabel, by the way, he is the prince of the house of Judah. By the way, you will find his name in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. He is the, the descendant of David, King David. And you'll find his name mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. All right, Zerubbabel. He went back as a prince of the house of Judah. He became the governor of the work. He's the governor of Judah. Okay, came back as the governor of Judah. Then Joshua, the son of Josedek. Now Joshua, the other leader, became the high priest of this remnant that returned. Church. These two leaders represent our Lord Jesus. Number one, kingly reign, Zerubbabel, from the house of Judah. Kingly line, kingly leadership. Then we have Joshua the high priest, a type of Christ, the priesthood. Together, king priests. Remember that the priests of the Old Testament, they were not king priests. They can look at the leper to see if he is healed and then offer the offerings. If he's not, he has to go back outside the camp. They have no power to cleanse the leprosy. They are just examiners. They just look to see if they are already healed. So no one was healed. Amen? Naaman wasn't a Jew, by the way. I'm talking about Jews. Until Jesus came. But notice Jesus. Not only he looks at the leper and examines him as a priest, Jesus has the kingly authority to speak, be clean, and the leper was cleansed. Isn't it wonderful you look at the genealogy of Jesus, everything goes back to King David. Actually, his, his uh, mother, her line goes all the way to King David from the son Nathan. And then uh, uh, Joseph, his stepfather, 
all right, all goes all the way back to Solomon. So Jesus has a double claim on the throne of David. And yet this king walked down the mountain, walked by the shores of Galilee, using his kingly authority because where the word of a king is, there is power. And how does he use it for his own personal gain? Be clean. Rise up and walk. Lazarus, come forth. I have compassion on them. This king used his power to bless all of us. Amen. Hallelujah. So Zerubbabel and Joshua together form the leadership of the land. All right? Kingly rule, priest, priest, priestly rule. Okay? Z just remember Zoro. <laughs> and Joshua. So they started work. All right? They began work and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and above to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. So they started work. And always remember, when you, when you are building the house of God, the devil will not try to leave you alone. How many understand that? Okay, next chapter. Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. Mm -hmm. Whenever you are building God's house, whatever it is you are building for His glory, the, de the devil will make sure there's opposition. The opposition is a great indicator that you are doing something that is significant and powerful. Amen. Although you don't like the opposition, be grateful that you are not someone the devil ignores. Are you listening, people? So they're building God's temple. The devil is jealous. And the people of the land try to discourage the people. They troubled them in building. And they hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. In the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. Times have not changed, huh? We are still having the same problems, isn't it, today? Except the writing is no more so slow. It's lightning fast. We have the social media. We have poison emails. The enemy's devices are still the same. And guess what happened? The work, effectively, the work stopped. The work of building stopped. You know how long it stopped? 12 years. Now, God never told them to stop. During this time, what happened to Zerubbabel? The leader. What happened to Joshua, the high priest? They are leaders of the land. We don't hear of them. Whatever it is, God's people became discouraged. They allowed this accusation to come in. For 12 years, the work was in abeyance. Nothing was done. At the end of 12 years, God raised up two prophets by the names of Haggai and Zechariah. By the way, your book of Ezra is before Job and Psalms, you know, it's after 2 Chronicles and your, in, in your Bible, and you find Haggai is towards the end of the Old Testament and Zechariah. Actually, Ze Haggai and Zechariah should be in the book of Ezra. They are contemporaries of that time. So God raised these two young men. By the way, they, they are very young prophets. In fact, Zechariah was called Na'ar in Hebrew, which means a teenager. A teenage prophet is indicative of the Benjamin generation in these end times. Nothing to do with age. All that is telling us a youthful generation will arise. There are people who are 30 and they're already old, complaining, complaining, complaining. There are those who are, who are 80, 70 and they are young in spirit. It's refreshing to be around them. It's nothing to do with the age. It's a picture of the Benjamin generation. Haggai was young and Zechariah was younger still. And God raised these two prophets because the work was not done. You know what Haggai did? In Haggai chapter 1, you'll find it because of time, I'm going to share it with you real quick. Haggai went to the people and said, Hey guys! <laughs> is, it, is it time for you to live in sealed houses or panel houses? In those days, when they are building God's temple, they will all live in tents. Seal houses means they now have a roof. They have a ceiling. They're no more having the pilgrim character or just, you know, building a tent for the house of God, make sure the house of God is built first. God's house is not even built. Only the foundation is laid and they stop the work and they now have ceiling houses. 
So Haggai says, what is this? You are living in sealed houses and you are saying the time to build God's house has not yet come. It's not time to build the Lord's house. And Haggai says, look at your life, what is happening? You drink and you're not quenched. You eat and you're not full. You earn wages and you earn it to put it in the bag full of holes. So guys, he says, because God's house is neglected. Seek ye first God's kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. What a word we've received today. Subscribe to the Joseph Prince Ministries YouTube channel for daily updates, and don't forget to share it with someone you know. You never know who might need to be encouraged today.